So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Axel Erickson, and today my co-founder, Zach Lawrence, and I are going to be talking about what we're building over at One Protocol. So um, quick who we are. Uh, we were both studying at Stanford University, um, computer science and mathematics, respectively, and chose to do Ethereum protocol development full time uh, in the beginning of this year. And that is not a decision that I regret. So for those of you who haven't heard about One Protocol or, or haven't heard about the concepts of virtual workers, the short version of this speech is essentially that instead of signing um, machines up directly as validators in Casper or as solvers in Truebit or more generally as workers in staking protocols, we can actually sign up smart contracts as these workers in these staking protocols. And in doing so, we can actually solve some fundamental problems inherent in all staking protocols, and we can also introduce some new exciting properties. So to get to that, we're going to start by introducing a useful model that we can use to think about protocols like Ethereum, Truebit, and Filecoin. And then we're going to explore different ways that we can ensure correctness in these protocols. And what we're going to find is that using staking uh, in the general sense is a very cheap way of uh, ensuring correctness. However, there is a fundamental problem with slapping staking onto, uh, onto a market protocol. So we're going to introduce that. And then Zach is going to introduce our solution, which are, of course, virtual workers. We're going to give you a sneak peek for uh, what virtual workers may look like on protocols like Casper, uh, Truebit, and even Raiden. And then we're going to finish off by introducing you to the idea of the one protocol, which is, of course, what we're working towards. So to begin, we think that a nice and easy way to think about protocols like, like Ethereum and, and Truebit is simply that they are marketplaces for some digital service. And in marketplaces, of course, you have a set of sellers and you have a set of buyers. And what the buyers do is that they form jobs along with payments and they send them to the sellers. And what the sellers are expected to do is to return some service. And perhaps the protocol that fits this model best is Truebit where, of course, you have a set of task givers, which are either you know, Ethereum accounts or smart contracts themselves that want to do some off-chain computation. What they do is that they create what, what, uh, what are called tasks in, in the Truebit system, along with payments, and they send those to, to the solvers on the other side that, of course, execute the programs. So we can imagine that the service being mediated across uh, Truebit, the market protocol, is quite literally off-chain computation like we would expect. But this, this model extends to Ethereum itself. So in Ethereum, we can imagine that the buyers of the service are all the people uh, that hold private keys and sign transactions. The tasks that they send to the sellers are literally the signed Ethereum transactions that they broadcast across the network. And then the miners are, of course, the machines that plug in on the selling side to provide the service. Um, but what, what is the service in, in, market, in the market protocol Ethereum? Well, it's quite literally having your transaction included in the Ethereum state. OK, simple enough. There is, however, a fundamental difference between you know, these market protocols and, and how we imagine a normal market to work. And this is, of course, that they're both open and anonymous. And what we mean by this is that anyone uh, should be able to plug in as the seller in one of these protocols. And when they do, we don't know who they are. Simultaneously, the users expect the protocol to reliably deliver the service. And the users really don't want to have to care about who they actually get, much, get matched up with on the other side. And if we think about it, this is, of course, the expected behavior in Ethereum. One, anyone can join as a miner. And two, when you as a user sign your Ethereum transactions and send them away, you never actually want to have to, you never want to, have to worry about which miner actually picks it up. So the question is, how can we achieve this? Well, in the general case, uh, the short answer is that we use financial incentives. So we can imagine that for any worker that plugs in as a, a, as a seller to provide some service, there's essentially two categories of strategies that they can employ. And the first category is the, uh, the first strategy is the correct strategy, which is when the seller simply delivers what the user expects them to. He performs according to the protocol. This would be analogous to running the, the standard implementation of some mining software. And then the second uh, strategy is, some, is the incorrect strategy, which is any other one. So this could be either that the, that the miner um, accidentally faults, meaning that the software breaks down mid-execution, or that he deliberately does something that he shouldn't do, think selfish mining attacks. And there are, of course, expected returns to both these strategies. And using this notation, we can ask, well, what's the cost of incorrectness to the miner that chooses to cheat? Well, the cost of incorrectness is, of course, going to be the opportunity cost of the 
uh, of correctness, which is the payment that he doesn't get because he doesn't perform correctly. And from the cost of incorrectness, we're going to subtract what he actually does make uh, when, when he chooses an incorrect strategy. So in order to ensure correctness, all that we're really trying to do is just trying to maximize this difference. So how can we do that? Well, there's really only two options. So we can start with trying to maximize the opportunity cost of correctness. The problem with this is that we're effectively saying that the price in the correct case should be higher, right? Which means everybody pays. This is analogous to block rewards in consensus protocols. And it might seem fine because it achieves what we're trying to do, um, but in a system like Ethereum, for example, these costs can go crazy after, uh, after a while. So with uh, three new ethers being issued in every new block and one new block every 13 seconds, all Ethereum users are actually cumulatively paying about $5.5 million a day to increase the opportunity cost of correctness on Ethereum. So a fun calculation to do is to simply take the number of ether that you have and divide it by 18, and then you'll find out how much you're paying every day to increase this opportunity cost in dollars. But there is, of course, a second thing that we can do, um, and we can try to minimize the payout of being incorrect. And if we're able to implement this correctly, what we achieve is that we increase costs only for the actors that choose that strategy. And this is, of course, what staking tries to achieve. We make it a part of the requirement to be a selling machine to uh, put up a massive security deposit when you join that you'll always lo lose if you cheat according to the rules of the protocol. So when implemented correctly, we can actually make this uh, expected returns of incorrectness uh, negative, which of course is going to maximize the cost of incorrectness. And the idea there is that for any incorrect strategy that a malicious miner can, can find either accidentally or deliberately, he's always going to lose uh, money if he chooses that path. So, so what we found essentially is that staking in the general sense is a very cheap way of, of, of ensuring correctness. And this is, of course, why so many protocols have, have used stake uh, in different ways uh, to, to ensure correctness. And we have you know, off-chain computation protocols, decentralized file storage marketplaces, consensus protocols, et cetera. There is, however, a fundamental problem that's not talked about uh, that much that is inherent to all staking protocols. And if you think about it, what we've done is that we've essentially taken a worker and we've changed what it needs to do. So instead of just uh, performing a task and delivering some, some useful service, we've also said that this worker needs to put up a massive uh, or, or, or a stake. So what we've effectively done is that we've limited the supply of viable workers, which in the short term means higher prices for the same security or uh, lower security for the same price. And this in the long term creates a big, big macro inefficiency in any protocol that chooses this strategy. And I think this is all very you know, up there and, and theoretical, but I think the pragmatic way to think about it is simply that which of the people that we would ideally want to run Casper validators also have $100 million in Ether to stake? And the answer is not that many. So this is the problem, and to present the solution is Zach. Thank you. So the solution is actually to divide the labor using smart contracts. So more specifically, you can imagine using smart contracts, which we term virtual workers, to allow two parties, one a capitalist who's providing some tokens, and another party, the operator, who's providing the computational resources to work collaboratively for these different staking protocols that Axel was talking about, and then use the virtual worker contract to share in the returns. So let's take a quick look at the actual logic that we imagine to be contained in these uh, smart contracts. So the first role of the smart contract would be in restricting how this operator can use the borrowed capital. So you can imagine in a virtual worker for Casper, the logic would ensure that the operator can only use the capital to sign up as a validator in Casper and validate blocks. Now second, uh, also important point in logic, is to ensure that the operator doesn't destroy any of the capital that it's actually borrowing. So you can imagine in the case of Casper, you wouldn't want you know, the operator to destroy the capital and that to protect against that, you would use the virtual worker logic to incentivize machines to be monitoring this oper operator and reporting uh, before he destroys any of the capital. And then finally, you would just use the virtual worker to handle division of the rewards. So you can imagine the work virtual worker 
would allow the operator and capitalist to negotiate some sort of rate which they would use to split the rewards. So now we'd like to present a few of the virtual workers that we've been uh, designing at, uh, at one protocol. So starting with Casper. So as most of you probably already know, uh, Ethereum is planning to transition from its current proof of work based consensus mechanism to a uh, proof of stake based consensus mechanism in one of the upcoming hard forks. And essentially all that means is that miners are gonna have to supply a stake in order to uh, perform work for the consensus. Um, in other words, it's Ethereum is becoming a staking protocol. So we have two ideas for how to uh, create a virtual worker for Casper. In the first one, uh, operator produces blocks and also supplies a small stake, which is uh, lost if he loses any of the capitalist's money. And then, yeah, the capitalist, as before, just supplies tokens, in, in this case, Ether. So the other model we have, uh, which actually applies to many different pr uh, staking protocols, not only Casper, is the uh, producer-signer model. So in this case, we actually further divide the role of operator into producer, which produces the blocks and proposes blocks to be uh, signed, and signer, which actually decides which of these proposed blocks to sign and then broadcast to the network. So this makes a lot of sense in protocols where the, the computation being performed is very expensive, and it would make sense in Casper if the uh, cost of running a full miner becomes prohibitively expensive, so a lot of players uh, can't participate. Yeah. So the, uh, the second virtual worker we wanted to present is our virtual worker for Truebit. So for those that don't know, Truebit is a uh, protocol on Ethereum which allows users to hire a solver to solve a uh, computational task. Uh, notably, these uh, solvers have to supply a security deposit which is slashed if the uh, task is performed incorrectly. And also, these solvers uh, are chosen to, to solve tasks based on uh, the size of their security deposits. Yeah. So in the case of our virtual worker, uh, again, the operator supplies a small stake, which is slashed if he performs incorrectly. And then this operator leverages the tokens it borrows from the token holder in order to increase its chances of being selected for tasks and also to be able to take on many different jobs. And now in this virtual worker, there's also logic, which uh, incentivizes different workers to monitor the operator and replace him if he fails to uh, perform a task correctly. So the final virtual worker we wanted to present was uh, one for Raiden. So for those who don't know, Raiden is a uh, implementation of, of state channels on top of Ethereum. Uh, essentially, if Alice wants to send capital to Bob or Ether to Bob, uh, they can create a uh, payment channel and send an unlimited number of transactions amongst each other off chain and then close this channel, only actually needing to interact with the Ethereum blockchain to open and close the channel. Uh, for many use cases, that's good, but for some, uh, it's, not, it's actually too much to have to communicate with Ethereum twice. So you can imagine if Axel is uh, communicating with BBC and BBC is charging Axel for, for every web page uh, he visits. Um, you know, Axel's not gonna wanna have to wait several blocks to begin visiting websites, and uh, BBC is not gonna wanna have to wait several blocks in order to receive confirmation of the payment. So, so Raiden does have a solution to this, and it's in the form of uh, mediated transfers. So you can imagine if Axel already has a uh, payment channel open with a mediator who's also connected to BBC, then Axel can uh, pay the mediator to forward a payment to BBC for Axel. Uh, the caveat here is that the mediator has to have enough tokens already in the channel with BBC in order to handle the request from Axel. So you can imagine some ideal mediator could be connected to all the major uh, uh, recipients like Live Peer, BBC, New York Times, etc., and then users, Axel, Bob, and Zach, etc., wouldn't even need to ever connect to these uh, vendors directly. Instead, they would connect to the mediator and send all of their payments uh, directly or, or through the mediator. Now, the caveat with this is the mediator is going to have to have a lot of tokens to be able to handle that. You can imagine potentially millions of dollars worth of tokens flowing through this mediator means it has to have millions of dollars of tokens in all of these channels. So we think that's a perfect opportunity for uh, a virtual worker. And so as before, we use the operator uh, token holder model. The token holders put tokens into this virtual worker contract and the operator uh, handles the job of being this ideal mediator. 
and uh, they split the rewards. Yeah, so this is just a preview of a couple of the protocols we're building virtual workers for, and we're planning to design virtual workers for, for many more upcoming uh, staking protocols. But the, uh, the ultimate aim of what we're doing is, is actually to create a marketplace for capitalists and operators to match up, be placed into virtual workers, and then start working for arbitrary staking protocols. So we want to create this shared platform uh, for a couple of reasons. The first one being that uh, there's a huge benefit for virtual workers to be all in the same platform in that uh, many of these virtual workers rely on a deep, you know, liquid pool of workers which can come in and replace their operator if he acts maliciously. And also, some of these virtual workers rely on operators which are monitoring uh, their operators, ensuring that they don't lose any of the capital. And then additionally, we just want to make uh, it as seamless as possible for any capitalist or operator to find the protocol which can give them the highest returns, and as soon as it stops giving the highest returns, switch to some new protocol. Yeah. So at this point in the explanation, people usually start asking me, okay, so how, you know, how high are my returns going to be on, on tokens if I put them into the system? And then my response to that is that you know, potential returns are, are always a, uh, a function of, of risk, and you know, there's risk associated right now with owning crypto tokens. It's also risk associated with interacting with one of these virtual workers, and so the returns are going to be positively correlated with that, and so uh, it's hard to say exactly. So m you know, moving forward, you can imagine rather than having you know, individual users plugging in as a capitalist or an operator, instead having smart contracts plugging in. You know, in the case of multiple capitalists plugging in via a smart contract, we term that a, uh, a fund pool. And uh, you could further imagine these fund pools tokenizing participation, um, in other words, issuing shares, which then the participants can go to exchanges on, making it even easier for people to start interacting with the system. And uh, finally, with what we're building uh, with the One Protocol, uh, we see that right now there's a lot of idle capital out there. Tons of people have you know, millions, if not billions of dollars in cold storage and ether. And whether or not it's you know, your ether and cold storage or your old smartphone and you know, your drawer that you haven't seen in years, we think that uh, if there's an easy, seamless way for people to start getting returns on that capital by plugging into the digital ecosystem, um, that could make the whole digital economy a lot faster. So thank you guys so much for your attention. So we're currently hiring, so feel free to reach out. And if you guys have any questions, you know, feel free to reach out to us via our website. Thank you.